Welcome. Today I'm just looking at the standard sequence I use for a normal echo. Really, I'm just looking at which image does it do and which measurements I actually take. Starting with the parasternal long axis view, I like to do a deep view initially so I can actually look behind the heart, looking for anything going with descending aorta or pleural effusions or pericardial effusions or any extra cardiac masses that can be seen. From there, reduce the depth, so I've got about a space of about one to two centimeters behind the heart, so I can still see anything going on there. I want to have black cavities, I want to have equal gain throughout the image, and I want to go be somewhere between the papillary muscles. Often from here, I'll actually zoom on the actual left ventricle, so that when I do measure, actually the walls are more visible. And so I'll take a measurement of the LV wall thicknesses as well as the end diastolic diameter. I may move the point at which I measure those walls up or down depending where they're best visualized and similarly as well the left ventricular end diastolic diameter will be somewhere where I can see it clearly. And similarly here just looking in systole looking at the left ventricle there and also the left atrium here particularly given this one was a history of atrial fibrillation which I was looking at. From here, I'll get a color flow image, <laughs> looking at the aortic and mitral valves. Here, I'll focus on the color and I'll move my window, my angle across to actually maximize showing the color flow in there. And I may need two separate shots if there is aortic regurgitation and mitral regurgitation that are not in the same plane. From here, I'll zoom up upon the aortic valve and aortic root, and I will actually then measure the aortic root in that view, leading edge to leading edge. And then similarly I'll do a color flow of that same view. In this case I've just zoomed up a bit tighter because I could see a little bit of fibro, um, either a bit of sclerosis or a bit of focal calcification of the right coronary leaflet there. So I've deliberately put it in the middle of my image and focused on that. Next I've actually zoomed up and looked at the aorta and then also just measured that one there as well. From here, go on to the mitral valve and zoomed up upon there. And I will physically scan across the valve, but I'll settle for an image generally between the papillary muscles to show the valve and similarly I'll capture images if there's anything to see on either more medial or lateral imaging. So I also have the color flow going there as well to be seen. And then from there, and again, it's got a little bit of mitral regurgitation, so I'm just trying to maximize showing it in the window. From here, I move to a right ventricular inflow view. I've just narrowed the sector a little bit because I, when I do put the color flow on in a minute, I don't want my frame rate to go too low. And again, one to two centimeters behind the heart, you can see the orifice of the inferior vena cava and coronary sinus will be coming in approximately there. And so here I've got a little bit of tricuspid vegetation, so I'll maximize showing that as much as I can. And I've got Doppler there. It's not a particularly great signal so far, so I'll aim to improve that as I go. So now I'm looking at a RV outflow view, and where I will try and maximize showing as much of the right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary valve, and as much as the main pulmonary artery, and down to the bifurcation that can be seen. Sometimes to see these structures may need more than one image to concentrate on the different elements of the artery. And similarly, so I want a color flow that goes all the way down so I can see any flow acceleration at any level, as well as any pulmonary regurgitation or anything additional flow such as PDA flow or flow acceleration through the proximal left or right pulmonary arteries. And looking at a pulse wave Doppler and then a continuous wave Doppler through the valve. Now looking in short axis at the aortic valve, again one two centimeters behind the heart. I don't want my cavity to be as black if possible. And here you can also see the left atrial appendage in this view as well. So zoom upon the aortic valve, and you can see it is trileaflet. And I can just see over on this portion where that little bit of brightness actually is on that um, proximal portion of that right coronary leaflet. And again, it seems like it's a little bit tighter just to try and have a look and see a little bit more focus on what's going on with that leaflet. So I'll look with the color flow. Then from there, I'll move across to the RV flow view again. 
and with this view I've actually tried to move the structure over more towards the middle of my picture primarily because you have more control of the image if you have it more centered so I'll put my color flow on there and then looking at the Doppler again in this case I've just taken a short axis of the valve there on some patients you can actually open this up quite nicely even though we talk it is considered to be a tricuspid trileaflet tri valve it can actually vary from two to five portions actually of that valve in truth and again that's just that view of that of that tricuspid valve and then I'll zoom up upon the atrial septum and using a lower color scale I will then look at the actual atrial septum there considering PFO or atrial septal defect putting my color scale back up and here I've twisted over the pulmonary artery again so it's more in the middle of my picture so I have more control and this year I like to be able to see the orifice of the right and also the left as much as possible and expecting if they I have a descending aorta down here too so I would see PDA flow there if there was any next I'll go to the mitral valve level in short axis then I'll actually zoom up upon that mitral valve and also put the color flow on so I can also see the point of origin of any leakage there and then continuing down looking at different levels and generally adjusting my depth as I go and right down towards the tip as close as I can get to the tip of the apex there and also including the right ventricle over here so I can also see if there's any pericardial fluid or anything else around the either chamber and from here also just put color flow on just to demonstrate there's no ventricular septal defects next coming down to the four chamber view here I have again one two centimeters behind the heart often I'll look deeper initially just to check and make sure there's nothing there and from here if I can open up both atria I'll measure both atria in that one view or if it's if I can't open up both adequately together I'll measure them and look at them separately and so with this one I didn't actually clip my measurement but if we just go through to end diastole and then I can also just look at a measurement here and then I'll measure my left atrium coming around here and see as well my right atrium coming around here so I'll move past that with this patient I'll actually look at his left atrial um, strain which I wouldn't normally do I'm still not convinced to have atrial strain as a routine it had some paroxysmal atrial fibrillation so I thought there may be some value in actually looking just to assess whether that strain was normal in this case which it was when you actually look at the numbers it wasn't too bad so now we have the mitral regurgitation that I'm now focusing on Again, trying to keep my frame rate sort of 25 ish or above. Um, having the color box wide enough to see anything else going on, and also see forward flow going on there as well. In this case, there was a little bit of mitral regurgitation, so I did do the relative Doppler in consideration of doing a PISA um, assessment just here. And so we can see that little dome there, which I have measured. Moving on to the mitral inflow parameters here, looking at the diastolic various parameters. When looking at a Doppler signal, I'm trying to make it about two thirds the size of the window if possible, and also see a little bit below the baseline as well. And so looking at the E, the A, and the acceleration time, often I'll try and center what I'm measuring here as much as possible. So here also I'll just zoom on the atrial septum, again just to look for color flow, any flow going across. Similarly as well I brought my colour scale down to visualise that. So here focusing on the right ventricle and trying to open up and again moving over to the middle of the image as much as practical and from here I want to be looking at the dimensions of the ventricle there too. And so I've measured one, I've actually come back and do a little more measurements later. He was very athletic so a bit more of a, a athlete type heart and there was a little bit of right ventricular dilatation so looking at the mitral annular M mode zoom on there and actually to again accentuate the size of the window for helping to ease to measure 
Uh, so focusing on the opening it up for tricuspid regurgitation again. And got a slightly better velocity, not a very strong signal, but quite adequate to actually measure. And so from here, as I was saying before, it's a little bit wide and a little bit long when you actually do look at it. And when you do measure, again, mid-cavity mid level is a bit broad as well as the relative length is a little bit long and consistent with Natalie Cart in this case. So now I've tilted across to look down the aortic valve and from there I'll do a pulse wave and a continuous wave looking down that valve. So now focusing on the left ventricle and so I've got my depth so that I can see the marginal angulus throughout the cycle without disappearing below but with having too much left atrium in the view. And again, I have centered my image because that's what I want to focus on. Often I'll get two just because of and here. I've actually zoomed on that left ventricle just to accentuate the size a little bit in case of measurement as well as also strain assessment. So end diastolic volume and end systolic volume and a normal ejection fraction. And then left ventricular global longitudinal strain, looking at endocardial strain with quite normal numbers going on here, normal over 23%. And so simply I'll rotate to the two chamber. So I've grabbed the first view and I've also just grabbed a second view where I have actually zoomed on a little bit more, just a bit tighter. And then similarly end diastolic and end systolic frames with a repeat of the global longitudinal strain. And again, similar to the number to the last one, making raising the confidence of the measurement from the machine. So here I'll open up the left atrium as much as possible. We can see the left atrial appendage to the side there. We can see on face to the valve there relatively. And I'll measure, actually I'll just start the second one there, but I will measure the left atrial volume to get a biplane volume as a routine. Similarly, I'll open up and try to maximize showing how much mitral regurgitation there actually is. So it's more in keeping with mild. Then rotating around into the apical long axis view, we can see the left atrium again, one to two centimeters behind the heart, width narrowed, where I can still see all the structures I want to, but just to maximize frame rate. So I'm looking color flow, looking at the mitral regurgitation. Then I'll just move my color flow box across just to focus on the aortic flow. And here again, a closer range view and one where I've just zoomed up a little bit closer again so I can maximize that for measuring my global longitudinal strain in this case. And so I would end up with a strain of approximately negative 23%. So now I've gone to a subcostal four chamber view. Again, one, two centimeters behind the heart, got the full width here just to try and see everything there. You know, if need be, I'll zoom on the uh, right ventricle or any other structures as required. But normally I'll just come up and have a look at the atrial septum just to maximize any PFO or possible ASD that can be seen. And now I've grabbed a four beat click clip looking at the inferior vena cava respiratory collapse and I'll also of course take a measurement of that. In this case I'm just having a look at the uh, hepatic vein flow and also the Doppler but only we normally consider we're considering right atrial pressures or um, tricuspid regurgitation when I bother doing that. And so from here I've gone up to the arch and you can see vessels coming off and the eye, of course, I want to consider size as well as coarctation. So I have color flow and Doppler demonstrating that there's no abnormality there. And commonly, if, more so if there's a new degree of suggested heart failure or like, I'll look um, anteriorly at the chest just to say there's no ultrasound B lines coming down. So it's the left chest and the right chest. And then some patients as well, if, particularly if there's pericardial diffusions or again history of heart failure, I'll look behind as well. And so I'll image where I have lung, I have organs below. And so I'm seeing, do I see any fluid in that space there? And similarly as well with the right heart. And watching as you see the lung field come across there. 
and so there I will finish that up. Thank you for watching the latest in my eco-education series.